And in today's focus, life at the Palace is more than eventful for John Solarco. Going well in both cups, not so easy in the league. The striker recently arrived at his 12th professional football club is Lee Chapman. Gary's been to find out if he'll be a super saver for Ipswich. We look back at the highs and lows of this week's FA Cup and Premiership action and forward to today's games. And of course, we'll be looking through all the footballing events of the week. There's a lot been happening, a lot to talk about. And Gary's here, of course, we'll be giving his, his opinion of what's been happening and the significance of that too. And we'll be off to Old Trafford, Manchester very shortly. John Motson is waiting to talk to Alex Ferguson. United are at home to Aston Villa today. The champions trail league leaders Blackburn by five points. Blackburn play at Spurs tomorrow. And Kenny Dalglish's side feature in our recent roundup of Premiership action. Blackburn Rovers' name has been on top of the Premiership pile every day for the last two months. Their lead has never been more than six points, but this week they had the chance to extend it. Whilst the other contenders busied themselves with cup matters, Alan Shearer proved once again he's in a league of his own. He's now four clear of Robbie Fowler as the big league's top marksman. His gluttony for great goals continued in the victory of Ripswich that put Blackburn four points clear at the top of the table. It also cleared the hangover from successive defeats by Newcastle and Manchester United. Shearer's third hat-trick of the season in a 4-1 win was completed by a penalty he won and he took. And they still had a game in hand. That was played on Wednesday. A seven-point lead was the prize for beating Howard Wilkinson's Leeds United. And for the second Wednesday night running, there were fun and games in the evening's big match. Blackburn missed a great chance in the first minute. Leeds were presented with a great chance in the second. Here's Brian Dean at the other end. He's away from Flowers, or he would have been. Now, referee's burn is with him. What a dramatic start here. Flowers way outside of his penalty area. What will Roger Gifford deem the necessary action? Ewood Park holds its breath. Red. One minute, 35 seconds. And that's the sum total of the night for Tim Flowers. Shearer trying to feed Sutton. Down he goes. Referee points the spot. It was Chris Sutton who forced his way on. It was Gary McAllister who got in the challenge. Gary Kelly was there too. Down went Sutton. Shearer from the spot in a breathless start. A Blackburn lead 1-0. It's towards Masinga. Hooked away by Hendry as far as McAllister. Oh, kicked out somehow by Mims, was it? Referee was right on the line and said no goal. Wonderful save by Mims from McAllister. Yeboah. On by Dean. McAllister trying to get in there. Wilcox right across. They all look to the linesman and he says penalty. And McAllister it was who won it. And Jason Wilcox it was who just ran across him. It's equalised. Blackburn six minutes away from winning it. Ah, oh, pegged back by Gary McAllister. The leader's disappointment was compounded after the final whistle by a one-man pitch invasion, which could have multiple consequences for Blackburn. But the first home points they dropped since October kept one or two of the fringe candidates just in range. Newcastle went third in a stormy win over Everton, who had two sent off. Number four, Earl Barrett, had cause to believe referee David Ellery was wrong to award a corner against him, but no cause to flick the ball away when it was retrieved. His second yellow card of the night brought a premature end to his debut. Having just spent £1.7 million on Barrett, Joe Rawls' temperature gauge was already rising when a minute later Barry Horn met with the same fate. The two managers' contrasting view of the referee's performance suggests there's still some middle ground to be found with a punishing FIFA crackdown. Everton's real punishment was delayed until the last 15 minutes when Newcastle eventually made their numerical supremacy tell with a scramble goal from Rule Fox. It was followed late on by the referee's last contentious award of the night. David Unsworth fouled Peter Beardsley, no debate. Whether he did it inside or outside the box or somewhere in between, only a laboratory microscope could have told you. Beardsley was ushered forward to lift Newcastle within 11 points of the title lead.
And there's the way the table looks before today's game. Blackburn, United, Forest and Liverpool play today in Newcastle at Queen's Park Rangers. But the issue of the week has definitely been refereeing. Gary, the events of Blackburn Rovers highlighted, that's one isolated incident, we hope, but it highlighted the case of the officials have every right to be concerned about what happens within our grounds. Well, absolutely, and, and let's hope it is an isolated event. Um, you know, referees are always going to stir up feelings among fans. That's, I mean, it's part of watching football is complaining about referees, but, you know, we had this incident, we had the um, abuse at Cantona and the abuse that goes on in, in stadiums all the time. And it's something we've got to try and do something about. It's very difficult to know how. Maybe we should try and start something like a neighbourhood watch, for example, where the fans, because the 99.9% .9 of fans are, are tremendously well behaved and families are coming back to football, perhaps we can leave it to them to try and sort out these um, bad supporters and the bad elements in the crowd. Self-policing and stewarding has got a lot better. There's no two ways about that. Yeah, I mean, let's face it, our football grounds are a lot safer to go to. Um, hopefully this is just just a climax that's come and then it'll calm down again. But having a go at the referee is a national pastime, but do you think standards are slipping? I don't. I think what is happening um, is that refereeing is becoming more difficult, really because the game's becoming faster. And it's very, I mean, it's a very, it's always been a difficult job and referees have always got criticism. And they, of course, make lots of mistakes, as do players, as do managers. Um, but there's a sort of high profile and, and sometimes important. But I think it really needs everyone to just, you know, calm down a little bit and um, just get on with things. Well, we all know that everyone makes honest mistakes, no two ways about that. But are we asking too much of them if the game's got quicker and the game's developed? Are we asking too much to expect them to deal with it and those honest mistakes not to happen? That's right. And there is, too, the confusion of the new rules a little bit, which are probably more confused probably by the managers and players than, than the referees. So there's always going to be inconsistency, especially when you're starting something. And, and these new rules do make it more difficult for referees. And some of the sendings off are certainly justified, but some of them aren't so. But it's difficult for them to judge. Maybe we should think about possibly using two referees, one in each half, because of the pace of the game from end to end. It's difficult for them to keep in touch. An extra pair of eyes, and people suggest as well that television replays could be incorporated. What is your view on that? I think it's great in theory, but in practice very difficult, very expensive for a start, and you could only really do it in the top games where you've got lots of TV cameras. I, it, it just wouldn't work, I don't think. I expect no one's done the experiment yet either, so we'd have to wait and see yeah, how it you works. You could only really do it in big, maybe something Shapey's like the World Cup. Well, as promised, we're off to Old Trafford, Manchester now. United at home to Aston Villa today. Villa beaten only once in the 11 league games they've played since Brian Little took charge. And John Motson is with the Manchester United boss, Alex Ferguson. Well, Alex, lots of talk this week about inconsistency in refereeing, about behaviour on and off the pitch. I mean, where are we at now, in your opinion, in this debate? Well, I think it's the inconsistency it adds to the frustration of the managers. And uh, what uh, angers me a little is that at the beginning of the season, we're all uh, taken down to Lancaster Gate and Ken Redden chaired them the meeting where it was all going to be carved in stone so to speak. And I said at the time, I said, it won't happen, that they all go back to normal, or some will go back to normal from last year, and some will try to stick by the new edicts, and what you'll get is just consternation among everyone. Nothing has proved right. See, David Ellery, who's the referee here today, the cup final referee, I mean, in sending off, say, two players in midweek, he would argue he's applying the FIFA mandate. I mean, uh, and they were all told to do that, presumably. Absolutely, everyone was, that was supposed to be the new way ahead, and I think it was welcomed by most people in the game, but it's not turned out that way. Graham Taylor said during the week he thinks this elite panel of referees for the Premiership is a bad idea and that there are some one-for-one one that might be better in the Ensley League. Well, obviously that may change next year. There could be a different uh, panel of referees next year. I think that some have to prove themselves and if there are good referees in the lower divisions, then obviously they should get their opportunity also. Mm. Let's get back to the football then. You're five points behind Blackburn now. If you win today, it comes down to two, at least for 24 hours. Would you agree with me that Newcastle shouldn't be overlooked in all this? I don't think so. I, I, I sell them not. Uh, they don't have to play us, and they don't have to play Blackburn until the third last game of the season. So they can't uh, get any, any damage to them by either of us. But um, I think Kevin's uh, done very well since Andy Cole left. He's used it. They use it for a cause for his players and they've all been fired up and, and they've got a passionate support, so you don't discount them. Now, you, of course, have got Andy Cole. You haven't got Eric Cantona. Uh, Mark Hughes' name has come up again this morning. More conjecture about his position here at Old Trafford. Can you clear that one up for us? 
Well, it may be, it may be clearer today, that, um, but um, I think it's wider than Mark this morning's papers. What is the position at the moment as you understand it? Well, I think it'll stay. Which is presumably what the manager wants. Absolutely, yeah. That's good news, I think. Aston Villa, the team that uh, effectively spoiled the treble for you last season, but you've got a good record against them in the league. Yeah, I think that I think the Villa games are always entertaining games. Uh, mainly, although this season's game at uh, Villa Park wasn't so, uh, but in the main they are, and uh, we were a bit disappointed also last year losing the League Cup final to them, and um, maybe our week form against them was good, but we're not taking that for granted. They are still, I think, in most people's eyes, still fine to get out of that pack at the bottom, John. It's you look at the league at the bottom, of the league, and it's it's incredible. Six points separating nine teams. And so until they'll get into a healthy position, they'll feel that they need to fight and bite and scratch. I think that's um, to be expected. Just a final point, Alex. You've seen and experienced most things in your managerial career. The last 10 days or two weeks must have been, even by your standards, uh, somewhat turbulent. Yeah, I think it was a period in which um, it tested us all. It was a real hard time for us, but I think we've come through it. I think we've come through it because we've... Uh, done what's right, we feel it's right and uh, it's unprecedented what we've done and hopefully that's all way to rest. Obviously we've got to wait till the FA thing comes up and that's a worry but um, I think that we've shown the right, uh, gone in the right direction. Thanks for joining us on Grandstand. Thanks John. And of course you'll be able to see Manchester United's game against Aston Villa on match of the day tonight. Uh, Manchester United, now they've lost Derek Cantona, they have to just get on with it don't they? Absolutely. Um, they're still very much in the race for the championship. Um, they're a terrific side. Um, Andy Cole's back after his cup tie. Mark Hughes is, is recovering fast and I would think, judging by Alex Ferguson's comments there, that he's back in his plans in, in the long term. And um, I mean, they've still got such a strong squad that they'll miss Cantona, but they've still got a chance. Football can turn so quickly. Mark Hughes is now going to be vital for United. I mean, it's fate. I mean, one minute it looks like he's being shown the door and the next is he's probably going to be fundamental in their chances of, of winning the championship. Just a final point on the refereeing and all the yellow cards and red cards that are being handed out. Mm -hmm. That means suspensions and managers like Alex Ferguson might lose important players at important times of the season. You've got to have strength in depth to, to cover for that. They have, and I suppose in a way that favours the strong clubs like Manchester United uh, and Blackburn, the teams that have got big squads. And I think that um, they can certainly cope with it. Well, we're going to hear from Crystal Palace winger John Solarco in a few minutes. Palace are still in both the Coca-Cola and the FA Cup. And after last weekend's fourth round games, for some clubs it was hidey high to the fifth round. For others it was bye de bye All will now be made clear. <laughs> to put Sheffield Wednesday in the fifth round of the FA Cup, surely. Oh, what a save by Paul Jones! Oh, it's a good run by Heaney. Near post, Chapelet! Southampton are in front. It's Dwight Marshall. They're appealing for hands. Get it! Penalty! Oh, Gravelon, great save! Mitchell Thomas can't get to it. Oh, Marshall. Biggins in the middle. Still Marshall. Biggins! The 33 year old on loan in his first game gets the equaliser.
support. Oh, that's a lovely little ball through for Durkin. Yes, he scored! Durkin! Oh, in the... Goals. Good ball. Oh, that's beautifully done. Giggs has scored it. Neatly inside the pits and chance of a hat trick. Oh, what a great goal. Good strike! Oh, super goal! And Evan the delirious! Barton for Earl. Real chance here for Robbie Earl. That's 2 0. Sheringham's cross. Came off the woodwork. Progrescu blocked by Bennett, but with his hand. Handball and Bennett is sent off. And Jurgen Zinsman with the chance to put Spurs ahead. Oh, what an excellent penalty. Klinsman. has given Manchester City the dream start. Johnson, one-handed, Staunton, hit the post! Oh, how close! Rock on and Gary Lineker's doing the hand jive. Next Wednesday, Sports Night features all the FA Cup replays. There are five ties still to be settled. Sports Night, BBC One at 10.20. Well, definitely through to round five are Coca-Cola Cup semi-finalist Crystal Palace. And the highlight of their season so far is that John Solarco, a player who knows the downside of football all too well, has been virtually an ever-present in the Palace side. Golf Crooks reports. <laughs> Crystal Palace training ground was a happy place to be on Thursday, with no one happier than John Solarco. His form and goals have helped take the Eagles through to the fifth round of the FA Cup, semi-finals of the Coca-Cola Cup and the relative safety of 16th place in the Premier League. That's, of course, if there is such a thing. And Solarco's in there. Oh, they've hit the bar. Three years ago, a regular place in the England side beckoned but two successive knee ligament injuries threatened to put Solarco out of the game for good. I was just completely numb. I just thought, no, I can't do that again. I just, you know, but, there were, you know, it took so much longer and I went home and actually went straight round Alan Smith's house and I, I sat there with him and Alan, Alan was always brilliant. He said, John, don't, you know, it'll be OK. And, but there's nothing anyone could have said that would have made me feel any better, but... In his own way, he did make me feel better. And I look back now and he can say to me, John, I told you it will all, all be all right. And it is all all right, you know. But then I was absolutely devastated. I was really, you know, I wouldn't say I was suicidal or anything, but it was the lowest I could have got. 
John's one of these lucky guys in life, you know. He's a natural sportsman. He's good at football. He's good at cricket. He's uh, quite good on the microphone. I don't want to get him on it, but he's quite good at most things he does. And I've got a feeling with John, he's born under a lucky star. I always said that to him. And I, I just felt with his luck and his hard work, when he did have that injury, he really did knuckle down Garth. He didn't go out clubbing it. He used to come in every day and he's worked at it. And that's why we just had to offer him a new contract. And in fact, this football club next year will be having a testimonial. So he's shown an incredible amount of loyalty as well. John's rehabilitation has been 50% perspiration, 50% inspiration. The walls of his study are a testament to how a spell on the sidelines forced him to think more deeply about the game. You can learn so much from sitting and watching. That's probably something I'd never really done, is sit and watch games and see, why do people do that? How do they do it? and look at set plays and, and patterns of play and, you know, way team, teams operate. And really, I hope that has made me a better player because I'll be more intelligent and I can think about the game on a, on a higher level. Linigan in pursuit of Armstrong, he won't catch him. Into the penalty area. Off the post, Solarco. Palace have scored. Although Palace have found goals hard to come by, their scoring record is the worst in the Premiership, speculation about the future of their stars, particularly centre-forward Chris Armstrong, has had an unsettling influence all season. If it has affected anyone, I think it's affected Chris. I mean, that's the one criticism I, you know, I didn't like about all that. I mean, Chris is only 22, 23, you know, he's, only, he's still learning his trade a bit. If they just let Chris play his football, everything would just come to him. Ian Wright and Mark Wright used to say to me, John, just concentrate on your football, because everything had come, the money, playing for a top club, England caps, blah, blah, blah. Whatever you want in football will come, as long as your football's right. And they haven't allowed Chris to do that, and I think Chris can go on to be as a top-class top striker, as good as anyone, and he'll score loads of goals, but if they leave him alone. My job at this football club is to win matches and it's also to keep the best players here. I was here uh, as the assistant manager under Steve Coppel and I saw our best players being sold and it has a knock-on effect. Now what I want to try and do is bring other good players here uh, to add to the players I've got. I'm ambitious, I want the club to do well and I'm not really prepared to stay here if the, the best players are just leaving and in fairness to Ron knows the chairman, he's backed me all away and on that and he's, th he's thinking along the same lines. Palace go for the double today over Ipswich, with recent results suggesting that Smith's side has now turned the corner. One man in particular seems ready to stake his claim again at the highest level. He could fill that England shirt with no problems at all and he'd be proud to do so, I know it. Is he back to his best, would you say, Alan? Oh, he's, he's better than his best now. You know, he's vintage. It must be difficult coming back from an injury like that. Well, it is, and he's done remarkably well. It was a long-term thing and it, there must have been times in that where he's wondered but he's, he's clearly back to his best. Now, England potential, you played with him in the international side. Do you see enough there that he can get back to that level? Well, I played with him on a tour of, of Australasia and Malaysia, and he was outstanding. He was certainly the pick of, of the players in that time. I think it was 91, and he was a revelation. He was a quick, um, good dribbling, good technique, and, and he really did look, look the part. He looked like he could handle the situation, which is one of the most important things. Very interesting hearing John Salaka then about the unsettling effect of if you have a talent, other clubs are going to look at you, of course, and the way that shows itself within the club. It's difficult, isn't it? It is difficult, but what John Salako said was absolutely right, that any young player must just concentrate on his football and all the rest will follow. If he can do it on the field, if, if he's got ambitions to go somewhere or somewhere, that'll happen if that's what they want. But they must concentrate on the football. Thanks, Gary. Well, Palace are one of several clubs who have to keep winning if they're going to keep out of trouble. They stand 16th, and today they're at Ipswich, who are in a worse position. Second from bottom, seven points behind Palace. It's a vital game for both clubs, and in the fight to drag themselves clear of the danger zone, who better to turn to than a striker who scored for no less than nine league clubs? He's never been relegated. Ipswich are Lee Chapman's 12th professional club. Gary's been to talk to one of football's most experienced commuters. Can you remember your ambitions and, and your aims at that particular stage of your career? Well, I suppose when I started off in the game, I, I started quite late at 18. You never imagine that you're going to be one day my age, 35. And I think that's the problem with a, a lot of players. I think it's going to go on forever and ever. And, and so did I at that time. You had quite a forward line at Stoke City in those days. Goff, Crooks and Adrian Heath. Yeah, I mean, we were the, the three musketeers, really. I mean, they were, the, they were my single days. And, my wild days. I mean, Good partnership off the field off as well. The, on and off the field. It was a great partnership. Well, 
One of the ambitions must have been a big move, and, and that followed to Arsenal, I think, for about half a million pounds. High expectations, but things didn't go really that well for you, did they? I was very keen to make the big move, and I was very keen to, to see the bright lights of London. And I just wasn't ready for it on and off the pitch. Um, I was too immature, couldn't handle the big fee, and as a result, the move was a, a total disaster, really. I never showed uh, anybody at High B what I was capable of, of doing. This is Chapman. Mistake by Keown. He's got Chamberlain up as well. Didn't need him. I had four great years at Sheffield, and it really re-established me um, among, among the top flight again. Um, I started to score goals. I, don't, I think if that move hadn't worked out, um, I probably would have drifted out of the game. So I have a lot to thank Howard for. Tell us about Brian Clough. Um, I can't really tell, tell you in a few minutes. It would take me hours <laughs> to tell you about him. Um, it was just fascinating watching him work. I, you didn't know what to expect from one moment to the next. And I used to sit back and it was pure entertainment for me. He was a larger-than-life figure, and uh, the stories that you hear about him don't do him justice. He, he, he was, he's a total one-off, and, uh, and he taught me how to not just stay, hang about at the far post, he taught me to go into the near post. Um, it, my, my touch developed a lot under him, and I, I started to actually turn with the ball, which I'd never done up until that point. So that's really where my career started to take off in a big way. Great cross towards Chapman. Terrific goal. Was Leeds the pinnacle of your career? I was reunited with Howard Wilkinson. Uh, and with a, couple, with a couple of months of joining, we'd won the second division championship. The following season, I achieved an ambition by finishing top goal scorer in Division 1. And then the year after, we won the first division championship. So it was a wonderful period of my career. And uh, I suppose... Really, I look back fondest to, to my days at Allen Road. They were a wonderful four years, and uh, I was very sad to leave him there. Although you scored goals for them, you were never a happy hammer. I, I signed on the same day as David Burrows and Mike Marsh did from Liverpool, and we seemed to create a spark. Um, and the following day, we beat Blackburn 2 0 away from home. And from being relegation certainties, we went on a run that, that sort of climbed to mid-table and have a great run in the FA Cup. And you scored lots of goals in, in I, the meantime? I scored lots of goals and things seemed to be going very well. And then all of a sudden I had a section of the crowd turn against me. Um, my last club was an another one where probably my style hasn't gone down too well. Um, I'm probably not as graceful as you were, Gary. Um, I haven't got the, the pace that you had. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm sort of a more of an awkward customer, and um, probably I look a bit ungainly at times, but um, and when, when the goals aren't going in, I probably do stand out a bit. Can Ipswich stay in that top flight? It's, it's going to be a really big task. I mean, I have this record of not being relegated in my career, but I've never been in, in such a predicament as this. This is really a, a big fight. George Burley's come in and, and changed a lot of things around. He's created a new feeling at the club. And I think we have a chance. We've got a lot of games against teams at the bottom end of the table, at home. And if we can win those games, I, I think we can climb clear. There's, there's still time. So Lee Chapman can be a good omen for Ipswich Town? I'm hoping so. I hope, I hope I can help a little bit. How old is Lee Chapman? I asked him that yesterday. He said he was 35, but what he failed to mention was that he was 36 tomorrow. It's so. his birthday tomorrow. Happy he didn't birthday. know enough to that, did he? <laughs> in that situation, is it best to go for someone with bags of experience, or is it also an idea to throw in someone with youth that's got bags of enthusiasm? I think it's better to go with experience. If you, if you throw in a youngster that has got that enthusiasm, you can kill it. If things go wrong, you can have a real detrimental effect on their career. With Lee Chapman, if things don't quite work, then there's not too much damage done. I see a tough rip switch. So Lee Chapman's hanging on in there, but for longevity, no one's going to beat Sir Stanley Matthews' record. He played his last game when he was 50, and football paid tribute to him this week on his 80th birthday. As Sir Bobby Charlton once said of the wizard of the dribble, I don't use the term genius lightly, 
but Stanley was a genius. People say Stanley Matthews, and then they say the Stanley Matthews final. No, it wasn't my final. Gerald, it was uh, Stan Ward or something. I mean, what a player, and he scored three goals. I mean, when he scored three goals in the final, it's his night, it's his day, he's the man of the match. And when I give a, a pass, when I give, it was such a simple pass, it wasn't if I beat three men in the penalty box and the, and the player just tipped it in. Then when I passed it, uh, then a lot of credit must go to Bill Perry who scored. But what does the medal that you got on cup final day mean to you now? Very much, because you know, when you're a youngster, there was three things what uh, I wanted. The first was to uh, win a cup winner's medal. Uh, this, no, the first one to play for your local club. That was an ambition. Then the next is the, winner, the cup winner's medal, and the third play for England. You were at that dinner in midweek. Mm. The affection towards Sir Stanley is incredible, isn't it? Absolutely. It was a privilege to be there. He's, um, he epitomises really everything that's good about the game. Um, fantastic sportsman, great ambassador to football.